fitting swim, bike and run training into our busy lives is a constant challenge as a triathlete and it's one that coach Matt Dixon completely understands and has actually based his coaching philosophy around performance both in triathlon but more importantly in life as a whole. Now he has promised to share me some tips on how he goes about this but apparently first I have to be put through my paces in his cycle class here at Purple Patch Performance so wish me luck. Matt, thank you for that. I am feeling kind of awake, I would say, and, and revived, but yeah, pretty tough session. Um, and I think it's just a prime example, isn't it, of how we've got to fit things in around our day. And I know that that's your, you know, you're working with a lot of age group athletes and it's about managing your time, but also your life and, and the balance. And, mm -hmm. I mean, I'd love you to just talk more about how you help athletes find that balance in their, their sport and their work life. Yeah, well, I, I think that firstly, well done yeah, in the I session. Survived. You uh, you survived. Yeah. I think I think that's worthy of us uh, uh, saying. <laughs> Uh, you, you managed to navigate, and <laughs> if there is a bar of mediocrity, you cleared it, which oh. was uh, which was wonderful. But uh, um, no, I, I, you know, we we tend to work with a lot of very very busy time staff people, as we call them, that are trying to, in in our phrase, integrate the sport into life. And uh, and I think the the first thing for us is determining what success is, and. Everyone that we work with is really ambitious, really goal-driven, highly aspirational. They want to finish an Ironman, they want to, whatever it might be, finish a marathon. And, and that's fantastic and important and, and we want people to achieve results, but not at the expense of the rest of their life. And so for us, it's, it's really taking on the journey of sport and everything that comes from it, all of the lessons, all of the pride, satisfaction, but in taking on that journey, we want our athletes to also amplify their health, be able to show up and perform in the workplace, be the best version of themselves as family. And from that setting, if you have that right, and then it becomes more of an optimization challenge. So rather than taking a perceived necessary plan and dumping it on top of life, we tend to approach it from the other side where we say, let's look at the landscape of life. Let's look at the non-negotiables, the things that are really important, all of your work meetings, your family commitments, maybe your coaching, Johnny's soccer team, whatever it might be. Let's add in the critical components that support your health, so eating habits, sleeping, etc. And then what is left over, those are your training hours. And with those training hours, great, how do we optimize? And so it's very individual for each athlete. You have some people that have 25 hours a week, some people that have seven. And so it's a very different approach to tackle performance in sport and life, basically. And how, you know, you're giving those sort of hours spectrum, but say someone comes to you and says, you know, like I've got to work this many hours, I've got, I've, I really have to do these family commitments and but I'm happy to maybe cut back on sleep a little bit here and there and I want to do an Ironman. Like, is, do, you, do, you say, do you ever sort of turn around and say, well, maybe that isn't, we need to change the goals or, is anything possible? Well, anything's possible. It's, it's interesting, there is, uh, th there's two answers to that. The first is the broken perception that to be successful in an Ironman, you have to train 20 hours a week. And we've got a pretty rich history of helping athletes get ready for Ironman, half Ironman, etc. really successful up to a really high level. And the average hours that a purple patch athlete trains is about 12 hours. So now that's not to say though that that's the optimal number of training hours to get ready. Our, our professional athletes train many, many more hours than that. And so we always talk about performance within context. So the first thing is I believe, we believe that performance is built on a platform of health. And so over the long term, you need to create consistency. And the only way to do that is to ensure that your training is integrated into life. So we can never compromise on critical habits that support the effectiveness of your training. So we would never let an athlete compromise sleep because at the, in the long term, that is gonna be a pathway to fatigue, underperformance, injuries, whatever it might be. And so we, we treasure components like that and time to actually eat properly, et cetera. And then we again come back to that optimization mindset. With that being said, there is reality. And so if someone has 
a really busy firestorm of life, a very busy schedule. They've got tons of travel and family commitments. We sometimes have the conversation to say, great, an Ironman is really wonderful, but is it the right thing now? And people always think that they have to do an Ironman right now as soon as they get the idea. But sometimes when you take a longer approach, build consistency, build many victories, the Ironman can come at the right time when you can build and life has that capacity. And so, yeah, sometimes we have to have those conversations. Oh, I, 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 yeah, totally agree. Do you use any kind of markers or how do you help measure with your athletes whether they've got that balance right or whether, you know, it, it, it is hitting that happy equilibrium? It, it is. So when we bring out data and metrics, it becomes a, a fascinating can of worms. And so uh, a, a lot of people have the misconception that I am anti-data or anti-metrics. And I think that, look, I've got one of these magic rings on. I think that data provides a fascinating insight to support what is happening in here, what we call your inner animal. And so most, most of our athletes track via everything that you might have as our heads up display. So monitoring internal stress with heart rate monitors, external output with power meters. And we track that over the course of time and we make sure that people are, are progressing, not regressing. And then many of, many of our athletes, we like to look at some of the biometrics over the course of time. So some of their health profiles and, uh, and we look at those components. But the most important thing is an honest, pragmatic conversation with yourself. So data is wonderful. It's a great tool to leverage, but it never drives the program. And, and I much prefer every morning that the best thing that any person can do is pause for a couple of seconds and check in with themselves. How do I feel? And that often provides 90% of the answer and then you can use the data to actually validate and help provide a, a continual perception. And of course, coaching helps that as well. Yeah, and I guess it's kind of slightly overlapping, but just digging into that a little bit more of, of those stresses of life. I know there's certain apps and there's, you know, there's various measurements of our daily stress and the stress that, the physical stress. And I think athletes, it's, it's very hard to, especially if you're coming, you're new into the sport, but understanding and respecting the stress you get from mental stress and how that affects your training. What's your, your take on that and how do you involve that in the program planning? I think that's absolutely important. I think that a lot of people misunderstand where their big bucket of stresses are coming from. And stress, the interesting thing about the way that the body ha manages strain or stresses Training in itself is a stress or a stressor that you apply to the body by definition and it forces adaptations. But we are doing that within context of work deadlines, travel, family commitments, potentially broken sleep, maybe under fueling or under eating, all of these different things and stresses accumulate. And so you, you can't think about training particularly the more time starved that you become, you can't think about your training stresses in a vacuum. You have to think about it in context. And so for me, it, it, it begins with firstly, maintaining perspective. So all the way along, before you start any week of training, understanding the week ahead where your stresses are coming from, and then your role of your training as well. And so I think about for a busy professional or a very busy parent, I think that training has a couple of roles. The first is the stuff that we think about training, applying the strain so that you get fitter, stronger, more powerful, so that you can go and achieve in your goals. But there's also more of a soul filling factor to it, that you want a lot of your training to be actually low cognitive load, low stress, what we call soul filling where it can be that pressure release valve. And, and so we actually supply, in any week of training, I think about it as having these key sessions that are really driven, that you have to be focused and present on that will move the performance needle. And those are really important. But if I ask an athlete to be focused and present on every single session, then you're saying 10, 12, 14, 16 hours that you've got to apply cognitive load to. So instead, we have more supporting sessions that are a bit more free, fun, low stress, like our run that we did yesterday, yeah, that was out in nature. Enjoy yeah. And that creates 
and amplification of the soul and you're still doing valuable stuff, cardiovascular conditioning, tissue resilience, but you don't have to be overly present. And what that creates is the opportunity to have training be a part of your life, not a second job. Because there's no reason that this sport should become a second job for anyone. No, it is a lifestyle, isn't it? It's a lifestyle, yeah. And the final question on the sort of coaching aspect, you know, if you've, you've got that set time that you've come up with, it, you know, you and the athletes realise you've got this amount. How do you break that down? And is it purely swim, bike and run? Or do you actually include anything else in that time, even if it's a short amount? Well, I think that uh, we, we always talk about four pillars and four components, basically, of training that deserve absolutely equal focus. They're not supplements, they are absolutely on a level playing field. Of course, the first thing is swim, bike and run if you're a triathlete, so that's the endurance component. And then integrating with that, even if it's really short, is strength and conditioning and everything that falls under that, mobility, stability, core conditioning and strength. And so every endurance athlete should have supplemental but integrated strength and conditioning. And then the two that we've already mentioned, habits around nutrition and hydration and sleep and recovery. My label is the recovery coach, that's what I tend to be yeah. called. So it's, it needs to be valued as balanced as, um, as your endurance training. And so that, that's the first component. And then the second component is when we are building the training parts of it, swim, bike, run and strength, we want to have more of a dynamic mindset. And so what I mean by that is, imagine an athlete, athlete has 12 hours a week to train. We like to build the key components of your training first, so the two or three sessions that are the tougher ones, that are gonna move the performance needle. As we talked about, everything else being supportive, but having a little bit of a flex in how many real hours the athlete will train and how hard the supporting athlete uh, hours are. And what I mean by that is that sometimes life flows and it gets really busy. So it's important for the athlete to be empowered to say, hang on, life is flowing, I'm really stressed. So I'm actually gonna back off and reduce intensity or duration of some of the more supporting sessions so that I can nail the key sessions. And that creates a little bit of flex so that over many, many weeks, we create the magic word of consistency combined with the specificity of those, and that's how performance comes. Yeah, and that segues nicely. If you, you're talking so much about how you would coach. We get a lot of questions here on the channel um, from athletes who self-coach or maybe new to the sport and are looking for a coach or want to find a program. And you know, there is so much out there, option-wise, of levels of coaching mm -hmm. you get, what type of coach. How, I mean, can you just give a little bit of an advice to our viewers on how to go about finding a coach and what sort of coaches are out there and what you look for in a coach? Well, I think first it's, it's important to, for us to consider what value a coach should bring. And, uh, and I think that's really important because I think that a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that the magic of coaching is just in the prescription of the training. And that of course is highly valuable. You are hiring a coach or joining a coaching program who is gonna bring their expertise and their wisdom to build a training program for you. But the real value to help coaching success is that coach or program should also bring an element of education to enable you to understand yourself as an athlete, how to actually self-manage. We always say, if you're really successful as a coach, you should become less relevant. And, uh, and that becomes really important. So having that sense of accountability, empowerment, et cetera. And then thirdly, a coach should really, as you are building, even if it's the best training program in the world, every single athlete will, over, will, will have to overcome obstacles and adversity. And to do that, when the athlete is in the weeds day by day, the coach should help the athlete get their head out of the room come up and see the big picture. And so that perspective is absolutely critical. So when you combine those three things, that's what you're looking for. And uh, I, I will add, by the way, community is also really valuable, yeah. whether it's something online, whether it's, I think that every single time, athletes are always more successful when they are not going on the journey alone. So a coach can bring it, but also a community can bring it. We really like athletes to train together, et cetera. So in there, if someone's considering a coach, I think the first thing is to have a little bit of introspection around who am I as an athlete and what do I need? 
because there are some fantastic coaches out there whose expertise might not be anchored in your situation. And, and a great example is, you know, if you, if you are really busy and time starved, you need to have a, a coach that has a lot of empathy for that situation, that has a lot of passion for that. If you're very, very driven and, matri and uh, metric based and, and engineer brained, if you want to call it that, you might want to have a coach that anchors in that. So doing a little bit of homework around who am I, what are my needs, where are my weaknesses that I need support, and then looking at the coaches and not just going by reputation from the magazines and the media and the podcast, but who actually is sort of singing to your hymn sheet. Yeah. And, and I think that that's really important. And there are a lot of fantastic coaches that you might not have heard of, but actually have a great passion and commitment. And so I think that that's the first thing of really lining up uh, on that side of stuff. Yeah, really wise, I think that's, yeah, spot on. Um, Matt, I think, um, yeah, that's been really fascinating insight. Thank you so much for sharing it. Thank you for putting me through my paces first thing this morning. Um, got to crack on with the rest of the day, I think. So yeah, if you guys, thank you. If you guys have enjoyed it, do give us a like. And remember, you can hit the globe and subscribe to our channel too.